Salute is a program for and about men and women who have served our country. Our program includes news about the laws that affect veterans, information on benefits and services, and news from veterans organizations. And now, our host, Bob Peters. Hello and welcome to Salute. My guest today is Mike Lissio, who is a Vietnam vet. Uh, you have a rather interesting story, which I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself first. Where did you grow up? And uh... I grew up in uh, Orange, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, I went into the construction field, uh, repair of heavy equipment at a young age. And, uh, and I left New Jersey at age 19 and went to Los Angeles, California. To be an actor. To pursue an acting career. Yeah. And, uh, and my day job was repairing heavy equipment and stuff, which was very good. And I supported myself that way. And, and I got my acting career off. I was in a, a Dr. Kildare and a Ben Casey back in those early 60 days. Mm. And as uh, soon as President Kennedy was shot, that was what, like November 23rd of 63, I, uh, I got my draft notice a month later. Mm -hmm. I was 21, but they had a while catching up to me because I moved from New Jersey to uh, California. And uh, I, had, I got my draft notice and I knew this was it, They're going to Vietnam, so I, I thought, I want to go in with the Navy instead of the Army. And I had a friend who was a, a lieutenant in the North Hollywood Naval Reserve, and he said, come on down. If you're willing to go immediate active duty, I'll get you before the Army gets you. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what happened. And, yeah. uh, and you, you were in how long? Two years. Two years, years active I thought, I thought duty. The, I, thought, oh, I thought the Navy had four years active. Well, yeah, but I was Navy Reserve. I joined oh. Navy Reserve. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't even get into the regular Navy because I didn't have a high school diploma at the time. I got my GED when I was in. Mm. But uh, we tell a lot of kids, you know, on this on this show, we tell a lot of kids, man, you got to get that high school diploma. Oh, you know, yeah. you got to get at least college. Cause, oh, uh, now they won't even take you without yeah. a high school diploma. Yeah, education yeah, is a big deal. Yeah. When the Iraqi war started, they were taking everybody, mm -hmm. you know. But now you got to have a high school diploma, yeah. and if so, you want a good job, you become an officer. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, you went into the reserves and... Immediate active duty. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I put up my hand in... Uh, in uh, February of 1964, and by March, I was gone. And I went to San Diego uh, to boot camp, and... Uh, yeah, that's, well, you went to the right place. You know, some, some of these people go up to, what is it, uh, Michigan or something? Oh, yeah, that was the other. Oh, that was another reason I moved to California. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, uh, you know, I, I said I was CB potential. So they sent me to San Diego and kept me in Los Angeles. I went into every weekend. I went home and uh, looked for acting jobs while I was in the Navy. You mm -hmm. know, so it, it worked out very well until they assigned me to the Hornet. Yeah, and I was in security in the in the Navy. I I guarded nuclear weapons training center and and all kinds of stuff. I was on the boxing team. So that's oh. how I got those privileges, you know. Yeah. And uh, what was your record? Sixteen and zero. Oh, that's I great. I won sixteen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Not all knockouts, but technical. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know you had an interesting career, and then you, uh, you were on the, the ship, and you wound up in Vietnam, right? I was on the USS Hornet, CBS twelve. And uh, we went to the South China Sea, the Gulf of Tonkin, and, and uh, then they said, uh, when uh, uh, Johnson said, we got to have an escalation, we gotta, and they said, uh, we got to build a port at Da Nang. I'm, they didn't say that to me, but uh, 
I had construction experience, and so they assigned me to a, a construction battalion. I was deployed to Da Nang, and it was uh, just beach at the time, China Beach, you may have heard of that oh, sure. term. Sure, yeah. And uh, and I uh, helped build the airfield. I cleared with the, the bulldozers and kept them running so they can lay the sheet metal for a temporary airfield in uh, Da Nang. And uh, the whole time we were there, the marble mountains surround Da Nang, the city of Da Nang. And they're marble mountains because they are made of marble. And they had caves in them. And they fired mortars all the time trying to stop us from yeah. building that thing. You'd just hear the sound, bloop, bloop. The mortars leaving the tubes, yeah. bloop. And then everybody duck or get it. <laughs> you know, combat can be boring sometimes, you know, when the incoming, there's nothing you can do, just go hide. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's the way it was. But I, there was also some men who were hit direct by mortars. And yeah. I'll never forget that image. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. A lot of sacrifices made. Yeah. And uh, so how long, how long were you there? I was in Da Nang eight months. And you got yeah. the runway built? Got the runway built and the supply depot, Naval and Marine Corps supply, you know. The Marine jets, the Navy jets were able to come in and they were with supplies. And that was just south of the DMZ. That was a very, Da Nang was a very strategic position, you mm -hmm. know. It was miles from... Uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, it was miles from there, so, and that's where we had our influence with the South, you know. Uh, so we had, to, in Da Nang is, uh, the airfield there now is loaded with Agent Orange. Oh boy. Because that's where they yeah. originally started it. Yeah. And it's the Da Nang airport, not the one I built on the beach. The regular Da Nang airport we used later on, and that's when the Asian orange and the chemicals were poured into the planes and everything else like that. Uh, they're still cleaning it up. Yeah, they will forever, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So have you been tested? Uh, no, I haven't. Well, you should get tested, my yeah, friend. Yeah, I know, I, I know. The, I've been in the VA system for over 30 years, yeah. and they've said that to me. But I don't think I was subject to it. See, I was a little bit before that. What I'm telling you about Da Nang and the airport, and that's what, mm -hmm. that came after I left. I was out of there of, uh, you know, January of 66. I was out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was a little bit before all that, you know. So napalm was the big thing when yeah. I was there, you know. They <laughs> napalmed everything around us, you know, protecting us from, uh, you know, I was just construction from building, you know. Mm. They didn't want us to establish a, a base. Yeah. Yeah. So you did, what, two years of active? After a one-year duty in Vietnam. Eight months I was in Vietnam. Uh -huh. Then I, uh, I got taken out for a disability into Hong Kong. Uh, and after your military career, or go well, as short as it was, is over. Yeah. You go out into I, private sector. I went. To, I was discharged in Long Beach, California, very close to where I was living, and and uh, got rid of my uniform and walked off the bit. But they know you, <laughs> you're military, and at that time. Yeah, we, know, yeah. Yeah. We weren't popular. No. <laughs> no. But no. Uh, no, then I went right into a, I just didn't talk about Vietnam. I didn't tell anybody I was there or anything. And uh, I went into the, uh, I went back to acting and I got some, but I missed a lot of time, you know, of my youth mm. for the, for the, for the acting. And, uh, but I, I got jobs and, but I had to, I went into the insurance business and I did very well. Uh, and uh, that I thought I don't want to look with acting you have to look for a job every day yeah you know you're always unemployed 
you're yeah. always looking for a job. And always I'd a, like always a waiter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you had to have your day job, yeah. you know. And I was doing that with the construction thing and all that, but it was just too much. So, uh, so I found the insurance industry. Uh, it was very easy for me, and uh, I rose quickly. And and uh, I kind of got away from acting for a while, but then I resumed it later on. Years yeah. later, yeah. I so had a, after so many years, you're retired, and now you're living here happily in the villages. This is something. I've been here uh, one year. To this day. Oh, really? Yeah, one year, February 15th, my house closed last oh. year. And I'm here because I have uh, four sisters and one brother who lives here. And wow. of course, they're all married, so I have in laws too. So uh, I come well, so, from Somewhere the along the line, though, you, you, you thought, well, I think I'll take a little run, right? Oh, God. I mean, I, how did the running start? Yeah, you, you said you, you always ran, right? No, I didn't always no. run. I was a bodybuilder. I was Mr. Teenage America in 1962, uh, before Arnold Schwarzenegger was a popular name. Yeah. I was a little bit ahead of him. You were there before Arnold? Yeah, but <laughs> I know Arnold. Oh, do you? Oh, I worked out with Arnold many yeah. times yeah. in Venice. Well, we want to get to the real stuff here. I want to know about this. One day you okay. decide that you're going, to, and it's on your shirt right there, you're going to make this run. Right. In 19, uh, when I was 50 years old, in 1993, my sister, who was a marathoner, called me and said, why don't you get into running? We were talking, and she said, why don't you? I said, you know, I've never tried that. I used to run, I was boxed, mm, and I yeah. did road work. Yeah, do road work, yeah. Yeah. I, she said, why don't you do recreational running? Go ahead. And I did, and within a year, I ran the Los Angeles Marathon. And uh, after I finished that, I said, I got to take this running someplace else. You know, I, I got to do more. And I got home, and I read in the Runner's World magazine that the first Hanoi Marathon, you know, we didn't have normal relations with Hanoi. Uh, 1994, Governor, uh, President Clinton lifted the embargo, and uh, so then we had normal relations. And I said, well, let me go do that Hanoi Marathon. And while I was training for that, I thought, I'm going all the way over there. I got to do something bigger for these people. I felt guilt for being participating in that war, you know. and. Uh, and that's when I decided, I was running in the park one day, and I said, I'm going to run from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, so I completed the, the marathon in Hanoi, and three weeks later, I told the government I was doing I didn't ask per permission. I just let them know my intentions. I'm going to run from Hanoi. The only thing they said to me was, your visa's only good for 30 days. How, how you better fast run you fast. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I said, it's going to take me longer than that. I said, but I'll worry about that on the way, which uh, I knew I could do because I, I had the, the people, the citizens were so into me. If you saw that tape, the crowds that were out because this one American was running for friendship and every, when my visa would run out, I'd go into the, the police office and they'd renew it again for another 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it was, uh, it was incredible. So the total, uh, how many days? Did 81 days. 81 days. But and there were rest days in between. Yeah. And I'd help pull boats up the people, because I was close to the beach the whole time. I wanted to stay out of the jungle because of malaria, mosquitoes. You yeah. Know? And so I, they told me, stay close to the beach. And, uh, and I did, and I slept on the beach many, many times, and uh, I wrapped myself in my mosquito net. I had a f 
full mosquito body mosquito net, and I just wrap myself in that and and sleep at night. And uh, that was great, you know. And the the temperature and the climate in Vietnam the whole time. I left on February fifth, nineteen ninety five, and I. And I arrived in in uh, in April, and the climate was just wonderful the whole time. There was very little rain, it wasn't cold, and it wasn't hot. You know, in in Hanoi, before I left, you have to put the heat on in the hotel. It gets cool there. People mm -hmm. don't think it gets hot in or cold in Vietnam, but up in the north, it does. And. Uh, I was fully dressed. I had to, to take off clothes as I was running because it got too hot. But the people were wonderful to me the whole time. Yeah, I'll tell you, that, that'll be some experience. Oh yeah, bananas, uh, coconuts, they'd stop me and, hand, and I thought, uh, are they bringing me a hand grenade? <laughs> Do so you really like me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but. I, they were just so wonderful, they, all the people. And they'd invite me for the house for dinner, the house, a grass hut, you know, with no walls, you know. And uh, I thought, they don't have enough food for their own family. So I'd give them money to buy chicken, which is the most expensive meat in, Cal in uh, Vietnam. Chickens are expensive. They don't eat a lot of beef. You know, or poultry. And, yeah. yeah, and they keep the chickens alive to lay the eggs, yeah, and reproduce as long as they can. And uh, they're free-range chickens, so they're very tough because their muscles are dodging the the motorbikes and the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the bicycles. Uh, but I'd give them food, and they'd buy the chickens, and we'd have dinner, and it was wonderful. They just treated me wonderful. And they all had it on their televisions. You know, each little village would have a, a, a spot where one guy had a generator, because there was no power to all Right, the right. He'd have a generator, and they'd have a TV, and they'd set it up like a movie house. You know, and all the people would come and pay. Villages gather, yeah. A penny. 1,000 dong or something to, to watch it, and they'd sit and they'd watch Little House on the Prairie, and that, those were the popular shows there. And, uh, and they all got to see my run, because the Viet, they said, he's coming down, he's here, he's mm -hmm. here, he's here. So I was very popular before I got to the cities, and they knew what I was doing, and the Vietnamese people put the war behind them. They wanted to be friends, you know. They suffered such famine after, after the war ended. And yeah. I mean, oh, it was famine. They were eating roots, you know. Uh, so it was a whole different time. Yeah, I saw this article in the in the Daily uh, Sun, the newspaper down there in the villages, uh, and that's that's when I saw you. I saw this article. I said, I got to get this guy on the show. Uh, you know, because it puts things into perspective. It says that uh, it's like running from the villages to Green Bay, Wisconsin, 1,380 miles, or the villages to Boston, Massachusetts. You know, that's, it was quite the run, my, my, oh, my friend. Oh, yeah. You know, that surprised me, too, because I thought all the time. But when I was running in Vietnam, I didn't think about the the mileage in the United States, mm. and I didn't think about it till I got here to Florida. You know, uh, sometimes in California, I thought, well, maybe it's up to Seattle. Yeah. You know, from Los Angeles, yeah. but I never put it in perspective like that, and that's wonderful that they did that. And wow, Green Bay, Wisconsin, <laughs> I've never even been there. <laughs> But you told me something I, I thought was really interesting because we had a little chat before we, air, you know, put this on the air. Yeah. About financing the trip. Yeah. And where the money. <laughs> my own money. Yeah, and, and where you kept it. In my, I had a, a flesh-colored uh, fanny pack. I don't know. It's very thin. It's meant to hide the money. And I kept it right under here, around my waist, $22,000. Yeah. 
if I would have passed out or... Or if anybody would have known, yeah. you would have passed out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially in a country like that. But it was safer than leaving it in the hotel room. But after I was in Vietnam for a long time, the people were very trustworthy. I didn't have that fear anymore than mm -hmm. I did in the big city. Of course, you got people who go into a room, so I was always cautious of it, but I didn't have the fear that I had uh, just reading about how you should protect your money and all yeah. that stuff. And uh, But I did run most of the time with my money back. <laughs> and my passport, too, that's important, oh, too. Yeah, 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 I kept all my important papers. And whenever you checked into a, if I had a hotel or a guest house, you had to leave your passport at the desk because mm. the police had to know who was in. It's still a communist country, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's, that never bothered me. There was a, there was a white car because the government knew what I was doing and right. they liked it because it was good relation for the relationships. Yeah, right. Uh, and, but there was always a white car that I saw following me through the whole run. It would park way in the distance, and I'd see a, right, a white Russian Volga. That was the popular car. You there. were being watched. Yeah. But you had a, a little bit of a, you know, because we're starting to run a little quick on time, and we got a whole much to talk about. Oh, but, what, but what about a support group? What did you have, I mean, you know? You told me you had an interpreter, is that it, or what? That's it. I had an interpreter and a driver who drove the car and kept the wild dogs away from me. His mother died of rabies, so he was very careful wow. with me getting bit by a, but a dog. And I'd run, and the dogs would come out from the, from the side roads. Yeah. <laughs> And he'd go right after him to get him out of the way. Sometimes I had to jump on the hood of the car. To wow. get out. Not that I knew the dogs were rabbit, but I didn't want to get bit. Yeah. I didn't need a you dog. You find out the hard yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, you, got, you brought a few things that we, we want to show, and I, I don't want to run out of time. So let's go through what you, you brought here. Uh, this top one is what? This is uh, from Vice President Al Gore at the time. It's uh, April 11th, 1995. He was vice president. And uh, do you want me to read it to you? Yeah, well, it was okay. or summarize it, whatever. Yeah, he said, I am honored to have this opportunity to send my personal greetings as you are recognized for your hand to hold run to encourage peace and friendship. Certainly, you have every reason to take pride in this outstanding accomplishment. While I regret not being able to offer you my best wishes in person, I am pleased to add my congratulations to those of your family, friends, and associates at this special time. I am confident that you will continue to enjoy every personal success in the years to come. Once again, please accept my warmest congratulations and best wishes, Al Gore. That's great. Okay. And the other is uh, a photo of my finish, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, April 27, 1995, at 7.45 a.m. And I had the whole sports, all these are Vietnamese people. I had 600 T-shirts made up like this. That's why they all have the same T-shirts. And, uh, and They join you for the end of the run. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that yeah. had to be quite the yeah. celebration, too, oh, huh? Yeah, all the Vietnamese. That was the friendship. They loved it. And this is uh, this is from the wartime, a commendation. I don't know if you. I, I think it's well earned, my friend. Would you you know, want me to read it? Or? Well, no. you could summarize it. You know, uh, the events well, leading up to this accommodation. Yeah, I uh, I came back to the barracks. Late at night in the Pacific, you're not allowed to say where. I was in naval intelligence at the time, but I was with the Nuclear Weapons Training Center, and uh, a fellow had fallen asleep in his bunk with a cigarette. He was fully dressed in his, in his Navy blues, and uh, there was a glow around him. I woke up from the smell, the 
compartment. There were 80 guys in the barracks. The compartment was filled with smoke. Fortunately, I just had gotten to bed, so I didn't pass out from it. Everybody was silent, and I saw this glow around this man in the bed with his uniform, even with his hat on, and the fire wasn't touching him. Mm. And I just went over and grabbed his body, and I don't know where I got the strength to lift him straight up. I was a bodybuilder then, yeah. I was young. He was young. And stood him up on the floor and yelled for everybody to get up, and they all slowly came through, and I took his mattress and carried it to the shower and put it out, and, and I got a commendation for that. Uh, well earned, well earned, yeah, my friend. Yeah, yeah. I was glad to be able to, to do it. So now that we've made this run, you keep in contact with anybody over there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. My, my driver and my interpreter and many of the Vietnamese friends, they had my picture and my, this T-shirt hanging up in cafes throughout Vietnam mm. when I came down Highway 1. Wow. Da Nang, Hue, uh, Phan Thiet, Nha Tran, all the major cities. Have any plans uh, of ever going back to say hello? Oh yeah, I've been back many times to arrange runs. You know, oh, I, good for I, you. Yeah, for the Vietnamese people, not for yeah. myself, because they're used to only getting flowers for a run, and I make it so they get ten bucks, which is a lot for them. Yeah, really. You know, in an envelope, and uh, they really appreciate it. Well, brother, I thank you for what you've done in the name of peace and for your, your service in the country. Uh, would you believe it? Uh, we're just about out of time here. Well, you know, but I it was talked a, my heart out. Well, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you, and, I, and I'm really, uh, it's an honor to have you here. And, and I think what you're doing in the name of peace is what we all need to do. Yeah, okay. we've got to keep doing it. And yeah. That's what I'm going to try to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, i got to say goodbye. So to all our veterans out there, our active military and their families, we salute you for all you do. Till next time. This is our fourth year at Lakefront TV. We're still looking for guests, and we'd love to have you on. We're proud of what we've done in the past. So give us a call at 352-728-9707 and check us out on the Internet at lakefronttv.com. Spread the word and enjoy the show.